Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live with the Steamboat Institute. I'm your host, Erica Anderson, and I'm here today with Rachel Bovard. She is the Senior Policy Director at the Conservative Partnership Institute, which was founded and is led by Senator Jim DeMitt. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so you and Senator DeMitt also recently wrote a new book, Conservative, Knowing What to Keep. Um, but before we dive into some of that, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, uh, your professional background, and how you ended up working so closely with Senator DeMitt? Yeah, so I came to Washington, D.C., fresh out of college uh, in 2006 and started on Capitol Hill. I worked for five years in the House and five years in the Senate um, for people like Senator Rand Paul, Mike Lee, uh, Pat Toomey. And then I jumped over to the Heritage Foundation, which is where I met Senator DeMint. Um, I had briefly overlapped with him in the Senate, but I never worked for him there. Um, and so was with him at the Heritage Foundation. And about a year after I was there, we left um, to start the Conservative Partnership Institute. And so we're a two and a half year old organization and we really focus on equipping uh, and uniting and training conservatives on Capitol Hill. And so um, a year ago, we embarked on a project to write a book together and uh, it was a lot of fun. So tell me about the Conservative Partnership Institute. What what made you guys think that there was something missing to where that could fill that void? Yeah, it's a great question because there are a lot of conservative organizations in D.C., a lot of think tanks in particular that are putting out really top notch policy um, for conservatives. But where we felt there was a disconnect was, you know, you can have the best policy in the world, but unless you have the best tactics and strategies uh, to get the policy across the finish line, you're never actually going to be successful. So a lot of what I do here at CPI is teaching uh, Capitol Hill staff and conservative groups um, things like Senate procedure and House procedure, how to draft budget amendments, uh, all sorts of really sort of mundane things, but are really, really, really important um, for conservatives in Washington. And so that's a lot of what I do. We also work with a lot of the conservative movement, including members and their staff and outside groups um, to develop the best strategies uh, to get you know, policy objectives across the finish line to respond to different things like impeachment, for instance. Um, and so we, we host a lot of um, those strategy sessions here uh, at our offices. And so the book was kind of born out of CPI's also birth, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so how did that come together? How did you guys decide to write that together? And then what was the process like? Was, was writing a book all that you thought it was or, or were there misconceptions? <laughs> So yeah, we this was Senator DeMint's brainchild. He he really saw you know everybody trying to define conservatism and what it is. Uh, the left wants to define it as you know we're a bunch of bigots and racists, and the right I think is was having trouble sort of putting their finger on it as well. And so he really wanted to um, you know bring up you know the cornerstones of conservative philosophy, primarily from Russell Kirk uh, in the conservative mind, and you know rearticulate them for this modern moment. And you know, he came to me about this project, uh, you know, a little over a year and a half ago, and he said, "Hey, I want you to help me with it." And of course, I was thinking he meant help as in staff. You know, we, mm -hmm. we write the books behind the scenes, but he's like, "No, I want you to be a co-author with me, because you know, it's a multi-generational effort, right?" Russell Kirk actually says many times, you know, it's incumbent upon every generation to preserve and rearticulate conservatism for the next generation. And so he really saw this as a way of you know passing the torch. And I will say, Senator DeMint doesn't get a lot of credit for this, he should, but he has spent his lifetime promoting conservative women. He's given so many of us our starts, uh, myself included, and a number of people I know as well. And so, you know, he's always looking for opportunities to do that. And so, um, you know, we, we worked on it together. I've obviously never written a book before. Um, it was a lot of nights and weekends, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I still have my day job, right? So uh, I spent a lot of time in coffee shops, um, a lot of times sitting on my couch with my dog, um, you know, and, and the co-authoring was interesting because we do, we are from two different generations, Senator DeMitt and I, mm -hmm. and so there were areas that we didn't totally agree on how we observed things. And so we would have those conversations and hash that out. He would send me his draft, I would review it, send my notes and vice versa. Um, that was very time consuming. So that took a lot more um, of, of an effort, but, I can honestly say the book is incredibly collaborative. We we really worked on a lot of this stuff together. 
Well, I think that's such a great idea that you are coming from two different generations and that you are two different genders too. I think that helps bring yeah. in, you know, those different perspectives and probably made it such a more well-rounded book that like maybe spans the generations in terms of people that are going to read it and really get something out of it. Now, I know the book talks about America being obviously the freest, most prosperous country in the world. And we have so many wonderful things that make up our country, but as you mentioned, like we have to heed those, we have to make sure that the next generation um, continues on. So were there specific things that you guys wrote about in terms of like, what are things that maybe we're slipping on, some things that we really need to be paying attention to before we turn around and see, oh wait, that freedom is now gone. Yeah, we have a whole chapter on, on something called keeping our differences. And this is something I don't think we talk a ton about. Um, but I think it's really important, especially because we're fighting against socialism now, right? And so there's this push toward this equality of outcome, this idea that everybody should have the same outcomes. You know, the left tells us that we need socialism to determine this equality. But, you know, we spend a lot of time really talking about how, you know, each of us are different, not only our religious differences and our political differences, but all of us have different gifts and abilities. Uh, and, you know, the, this country is founded on this ability um, to, all of us to pursue our gifts and abilities as we see fit. And, and our society is sort of built up around this because this is how the free market flourishes at the end of the day. It's everybody pursuing their different jobs and their different you know, desires and the market regulates that. Or for our religious differences, right? This is really under attack right now by the left. They don't, they don't want any religion in the public square, but if they do, it's only a religion they agree with or agrees with their desired outcomes. And so I think conservatives have to do a really, um, significant job in talking about this. And so we spent a lot of time on that in the book and you know especially with socialism because it's the great equalizer, right? But it's the great equalizer at the bottom. Right. <laughs> you know, right. exactly. it's very easy to make everybody equally miserable. It is very very difficult to raise everybody up to the very very top. Um but in America we still do have the chance to all get to the very top and that's because of these traditions that have made our country strong. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty shocking just, you know, myself having worked on Capitol Hill as well way back in the day, just to see the shift in conversation to so uh, blatantly, such blatant promotion of socialism as we move toward the 2020 election. Um, as that conversation has taken shape to where people are really just fully admitting that they would like to have a socialist America, have you seen a lot more interest in what you're doing? And, and how have you seen sort of the conversation out in America, out in the public um, towards what you guys are talking about shift? Yeah, I think there's a, th this is again, a very generational thing. And it's been really interesting to watch because there is this, you know, very blatant push towards socialism. You have presidential candidates that are socialists, you know, Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist and he is unabashed in his support for these policies and he's polling really high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these, it's resonating. And I think, you know, Senator Domin's generation uh, is, is, is shocked, right? Because they grew up really witnessing you know, socialism as the greatest man-made uh, cause of death and misery around the around the around the globe, and so they really saw that. I think my generation is a little bit less educated about what socialism uh, socialism is and how you know deleterious its effects are. But we also came of age at a time when you know we were we came right out of, right out of college into the Great Recession, you know, and we saw the government respond to that not by protecting you know our parents' four hundred one ks or our grandparents, but by bailing out Wall Street. You know, and and no one went to jail over all all those things that happened that caused that crisis. And so there's a little bit of a crony capitalism sense that I think my generation has. And so I think it's really important for younger conservatives to say, look, we don't want that kind of capitalism, but we do still value the free market. And that's I think something that's harder for Senator Demint's generation to communicate because they're just so shocked that like anyone could accept right. socialism in any form, which I totally understand. Yeah. But there is a little bit more of a generational difference, I think, in what my generation has experienced, which hasn't always been great. And again, that's not the market. That's the government distorting the market. But we have to fix those problems as well. Yeah, definitely. And when it comes to conservatism, you know, it's it's been an, an interesting couple of years as Donald President Trump has come into office. And there's been some splits among on the right. But I would ask you, how do you see conservatism in the age of Trump? Has it changed at all? I mean, is it different than it used to be or is it really just the same and it's just sort of uh, um, kind of a little bit more brash now? <laughs> so I think that the, the, the foundational nature of conservatism doesn't change, right? It's built on these philosophies of 
like the title says, knowing what to keep, keeping our traditions, keeping our differences, keeping our faith. Um, you know, and those things don't change because at its root, conservatism is really a philosophy of gratefulness. It's being grateful for all of the traditions we can carry forward because, you know, we've been around for a long time and human nature doesn't change. So we have the benefit of hindsight and conservatives are grateful for that because they can look back and say, we know what works and what doesn't. We want to keep what, what works and we want to get rid of what doesn't. Those things don't change. The left, on the other hand, is a bunch of very reflexive policy prescriptions and dogmas and ideologies. And, you know, that can change. And so, you know, people, I think, like to assign that to conservatism. They say, oh, well, conservatives support this and that and that. Policy prescriptions aren't our thing. It's philosophies that, you know, we really carry forward. And so in terms of changing, those don't. But I do think our emphasis changes based on, you know, where we are in our current moment. Um, you know, now we're focused on promoting, you know, the market because so you know, socialism is attacking our marketplace. Um, you know, we really want to highlight the the victims that are killed as part of abortion. You know, we really want to talk about uh, those things. And so those things don't change. You know, people all the time ask me, you know, is President Trump a conservative? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know the man's personal feelings on it, but I do know that his outcomes have been enormously conservative. Um, specifically on the pro-life issue I just mentioned, he's done more than I think any other president uh, to promote the cause of life. Um, you know, and I do think that, you know, he's challenging a lot of orthodoxies. He's challenging the way Washington has done business for any number of years. And that's upsetting what he would call the swamp dwellers. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, like that is, is uh, you know, a conservative approach as well is to say, look, what's working here and what's not? Let's keep what's working and let's get rid of the rest. Yeah, you recently wrote uh, for American Greatness magazine, and I'm just going to read this first line here, um, which says, Donald Trump's presidency has done a lot of things, but perhaps one of its most striking effects has been unmasking the contempt with which elites view the rest of us. Um, can you speak a little bit more on that and why you think people were um, interested in something different? And, and what, I mean, not to get political, but just kind of expanding on what you wrote there. Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic in the Trump presidency, and it starts with what propelled him into into office. It was this, you know, bipartisan coalition of you know middle class Republicans and blue collar Democrats, and this populist impulse of people who really felt forgotten. They felt forgotten by you know the people they elected. Uh, they forgotten by they felt forgotten by their parties. They felt forgotten by you know the coasts, right? People in Hollywood would finger wag at them about how they should live, and and people in New York were only interested if they could commoditize you know what they were doing. And so, I really think there was a surge from the, the American middle, right? That felt just government wasn't listening to them, their institutions weren't listening to them, and Donald Trump was sort of the most disruptive force of all of that because he didn't come from, you know, DC, right? And I think that has upset a lot of people because he behaves in a way that, you know, DC isn't used to. Um, and that is that has shaken the foundations of, you know, how the government has run. And I think you can argue good, good and bad, right? Yeah. So I, I still think that exists. Like people still feel that way. They feel like Donald Trump is disrupting and they like that. Yeah. So on your book, and I'll just ask you a couple more questions. What would you say is maybe if you wanted someone to take one thing away from you know, the one thing, the one principle, one or two principles that you really think A, are most important and B, maybe what seems to be resonating most with people, what would you say those are? So I do think that keeping our differences is is really important. I know I've talked about that already, but that's one of the most powerful parts of the book for me. It's just this, you know, we don't appreciate that as much, right? Now it's everything is is sort of shirts and skins in our politics and our lives. Like if you don't disagree with me, you're evil. You know, that is is fundamentally unconservative. Um, conservatives appreciate the diversity of views, the diversity of religious beliefs, the diversity of all these things. Um, but second, I would say, you know, I've spent a lot of time, you know, reading Kirk and Edmund Burke and and I really came away with this sense that conservatives, you know, it is a philosophy of gratefulness, but it's also politics is so much a, a small part of what we do as conservatives. Um, you know, I think you see some of the unhingedness on the left a little bit because politics is their whole identity and their religion and, and you know, mm -hmm. everything. Conservatives are much more, you know, politics is a little bit of what we do, but the rest of it is our communities and our families and, you know, the traditions that we seek to uphold around those things. And so it, conservatism, I think, unlike any other political philosophy, is much more of a way of living, um, you know, that has to do less with actual politics 
than it does with approaching the world. And that's something I think has been lost a lot in our debate about what conservatism is. And so the first chapter, we really dig into this, it's called Keeping Our Covenants. And it's this idea you know, that we're in covenant with each other as much as we're in covenant with our government, but what that really compels us to do as individuals. So that would be, you know, the first two or three chapters I think are really valuable for, for communicating yeah, all of this. Absolutely, I, I love that so much. I think you're so right in terms of just how people view politics and where you stand on the left or the right. There is such a vast difference. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we know you and Senator Mint were out at the Freedom Conference this summer and we really appreciated that and loved hearing from you and everyone. We're gonna link that uh, video of Rachel and Senator DeMint out at the Freedom Conference this summer. Um, everybody check out the Conservative Partnership Institute. We'll link that and thank you so much. Thank you.